you might believe in destiny. But if you ask me, and I'm glad you did, there is one powerful force that drives human behavior and changes the world. Money. This Trident nuclear missile with its multiple warheads could obliterate up to half a dozen enemy cities, all for the low, low price of $70 million a missile. That is a fraction of what our military currently spends on bans. But the Reagan administration wanted something a little flashier, you know, and a lot more expensive. So, for example, the B-2 stealth bomber. Couldn't go as far as this missile, couldn't do as much damage, was easier to deter, but man, it was intimidatingly expensive. At two billion dollars a plane, it might have been cheaper to build each one out of solid gold. It was as if we were trying to bling the Soviet Union into submission. Comprehending the trillions of dollars and rubles spent on the military during the Cold War is like trying to count the stars in heaven. No mere number, no matter how many zeros, can convey the scope. I was born in the middle of the Cold War, and I lived to see it end. I was taught it was a struggle between good and evil, freedom and tyranny. But follow the money, and it leads straight to the corner store. Once the Soviet people got a taste of our blue jeans and silk stockings and fast food, it was no contest. They had always been told, we know, through Soviet propaganda, that Americans live terribly and we have terrible race problems yeah. and people are impoverished and we're all slaves to our capitalist masters. Yeah. But then they got, you know, a glimpse of like what our supermarkets were like. And mm. they're like, wait a minute, that's fantastic. Right. I mean, that has a big, when the information starts to flow, you right. know, you can only hold off information for so long. And when real live information began to come into the Soviet Union about living standards, whether it was the US or it was just simply West Germany, um, it, was, it was stunning to people. They realized that these are places that are not on the verge of collapse. They're not at war with themselves. They actually seem to be quite peaceful and quite prosperous. And wouldn't it be nice to get a little bit of that? Yeah. I mean, so in a weird way, the Cold War came to an end because people wanted a better choice of breakfast cereal. Yes, exactly. And maybe a you know, spare roll of toilet paper. Eisenhower presided over the first decade of the Cold War, even as he warned about its dire cost. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. Such honesty would soon become political death, denounced as weakness or worse, disloyalty. No mere president could halt the juggernaut of defense spending. By 1959, it consumed over half the federal budget. For decades, the arms race generated trillions in profits. Governor Ronald Reagan has ended this grueling... Then in 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected president, thanks in part by promising to dramatically increase defense spending. If you have the means to defend your freedom, you won't have to use those means. And that's what we're all aiming at. Reagan wanted victory over the evil empire, and he saw a way to get there, bankrupt them. Spend more than they could ever match. As he wrote in his diary, if we can cut off their credit, they'll have to yell uncle or starve.
Soviet citizens had long endured a horrendous standard of living. Only one in three apartments had hot water. Only one in 10 people had a telephone. And the waiting time for a new apartment was 15 years. The state-run economy was a joke, literally. As the saying went, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. You have an enormous military budget. 20%, you know, by some measures, 20% of GDP in the Soviet Union is going to this huge military right. uh, that will not budge when it comes to the budget. They're right. not going to give an inch on that. So, uh, and we, and we the, often forget this, that they had their own Vietnam, a long drawn out right. war in Afghanistan yeah. in the 70s and early 80s. That, which, is, which plays into the political part of it, right? So right. it's not just a collapsing communist economy, it's a collapsing political order. So right. they, they invade Afghanistan in 1979, thinking it's going to be quick and, and easy, and uh, it turned out to be a disaster. Soviet troops would spend nine miserable years in Afghanistan stuck in a bloody stalemate with local guerrillas. Mr. Gorbachev wants to bring the Communist Party up to date. Its old-fashioned methods are blocking his reforms at home and abroad. In 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev took the reins of power. After years of doddering commissars and apparatchiks, here was a man in the mold of Western politicians. Gorbachev knew his country had to modernize. He introduced glasnost, a new openness. But a little freedom can be a dangerous thing. When you have glasnost, right at the time when there's a lot of simmering discontent, people right. are furious about the economy, they're furious about corruption, they're furious about the inadequate you know, supply of everything. Um, they're also furious about the war. There's tremendous anti-war opposition. And when you allow for people to freely discuss that and publish it, right. and then have external sources of information, you know, you know dissident uh, writers and things, it is a recipe for disaster. In 1990, journalist David Remnick attended a screening of the movie Wall Street in Moscow. Now, Oliver Stone intended the movie to be an indictment of reckless greed, but it didn't play that way. To the Russians, it was like affluence porn. Look at that guy. He had tailored shirts and really expensive hair. He had a TV in his limo. When he parked it at home, he had a house with a TV, with a car, with another TV inside it. When Michael Douglas says his immortal line meant to demonstrate his dark, twisted soul, the Russians exploded in applause. Greed is good, or as he was dubbed in Russian, Zhadnest et Horosho. Zhadnest et Horosho. Russians had discovered the delights of capitalism. They no longer feared the West or their own leaders. The Soviet Union was essentially a third world economy boosted by petrodollars. But in the late 80s, Saudi Arabia, encouraged by the US, drastically increased its oil production and cut prices by two thirds. Soviet oil revenue plummeted. The two fellows in the Soviet Union were walking down the street, and the one of them says, have we really achieved full communism? Is this it? Is this now full communism? And the other one said, oh, hell no. It's, things are going to get a lot worse. <laughs> the truth could no longer be masked by lies. Communism had utterly failed to provide a minimum standard of living. One Soviet economist remarked, for decades we've strived for universal equality. Now we have equality in poverty. The final nail in the Soviet coffin was a fantastic futuristic vision. What if free people could live secure in the knowledge that their security did not rest upon the threat of instant U.S. retaliation to deter a Soviet attack, that we could intercept and destroy strategic ballistic missiles before they reached our own soil or that of our allies.
Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI, was immediately dubbed Star Wars. The nickname conjured up real images, well, real fake images from movies, that made it all the more plausible. The flight was the first in a series of test flights that would use a kinetic energy Eris interceptor to destroy a simulated enemy warhead. We had these missiles that they couldn't stop, and they had these missiles that we couldn't stop, so nobody was going to go to war. Yeah, mutually we, assured destruction. Right. And then all of a sudden we're saying, aha, we've got these, this system, this incredibly expensive system that will stop your missiles and that will totally shift yep. the balance of power. And that sent the Soviet Union into kind of a panic. Right. A quick look assessment of the first Eris interceptor test flight indicates it was a successful mission. The White House doled out the goodies. Contracts worth billions were awarded to companies in no less than 40 states. Whether or not SDI ever worked, Gorbachev believed it could, and he knew he could never muster the resources to compete with it. The United States, Gorbachev told his people, wants to exhaust the Soviet Union economically through an arms race and the most up-to-date and expensive space weapons. There's also a huge technological uh, gap. I mean, right. By 1980, the personal computer revolution is on in the United States, and we often sort of forget how revolutionary that yeah. was in, in everything, economics, uh, education, information systems, and so forth. And the Soviets were wedded to these 1960s gigantic, you know, building-sized uh, IBM-like computers. And so they weren't able to make that. They knew they couldn't make that shift. Right. Desperate to cut costs, Gorbachev devised a brilliant last-ditch gambit. He offered to cut nuclear arsenals in half if the U.S. dropped SDI. Panicked, the American defense industry went on red alert. It was a doomsday scenario, the loss of trillions of dollars from Star Wars and nukes. The military-industrial complex went into overdrive to stop Reagan from taking the deal. Air Force One touched down at Keflavik NATO base in Iceland tonight, carrying Ronald Reagan on the 20th and potentially most important foreign journey of his six-year presidency. After nerve-wracking suspense, the Reykjavik summit ended in failure. Order had been restored. Soon after, in 1989, one Eastern Bloc country after another broke free from the Soviet Empire. In Russia, Gorbachev gave way to President Boris Yeltsin. That same year, half a million American troops descended on the Persian Gulf. The United States and Russia joined forces to liberate oil-rich Kuwait from the clutches of Saddam Hussein. Listen to Master Sergeant J.P. Kendall of the 82nd Airborne. We're here for more than just the price of a gallon of gas. What we're doing is going to chart the future of the world for the next hundred years. It's better to deal with this guy now than five years from now. American forces would soon spend two decades at war. From Moscow to the Middle East, capitalism had won. But it would always, always keep fighting.
A few months after the fall of the Soviet Union, Gorbachev attended the 75th anniversary celebration for Forbes magazine at Radio City Music Hall. He and Ronald Reagan both appeared to uh, demonstrate their historic friendship and also because they were each paid $2 million. Meanwhile, new Russian president Boris Yeltsin was trying to keep his country from staggering, much as he did. Now, Yeltsin had grown up with Soviet communism and was still a true believer. He thought capitalism was this savage system where all the wealth was hoarded by the elite while the proletariat suffered. And then he took a trip to Houston and visited a supermarket, a proletarian supermarket. And he was amazed at all the fresh meat and produce and fish, the, the 20 different kinds of spaghetti sauce. He saw shapes of pasta heretofore undreamt of by man. Not even the czar himself had imagined such riches. On the flight back to Moscow, Yeltsin turned to his closest aide and quietly confessed that he was no longer a communist. Boris Yeltsin had learned to follow the money. <laughs>